So you're trying to figure out the correct RPE to prescribe for the top sets or the working sets. Now, getting this right will lead to the right training dose. And not only will it not overly fatigue the lifter, it will actually stimulate you to make good progress. So in this video, I will go through everything that you need to know about figuring out the RPE of your top sets or your working or back offsets. And the key questions that I will aim to answer are, why choosing your RPE matters, factors you want to take into consideration and the process that I personally use to help me work out the correct RP for each set. So without any further ado, let us begin. Now, before we dive deep in, for argument's sake, we will use RPE as a synonymous scale to RIR or reps in reserve as a definition. So why does choosing your RPE matter? Well, it matters because a set at a given rep range performed at a certain RPE equates to a corresponding absolute intensity or percentage of a one rep max. And this determines the training dose for that set and subsequently that session as well. It also influences the short and medium term fatigue, which can also have a direct influence on the equivalent intensity that you will be subsequently working at. For example, let's say you did a set of five at RP7 and you repeat that weight again, but afterwards the next set of five was RP8. The equivalent percentage of a one rep max ended up becoming higher by that second set. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing because you may actually want this intentionally, but it's something to keep in mind when it comes to prescribing sets, reps and intensity. So what are the factors that you want to take into consideration? Now, first one is going to be technical competency or experience. Now, technical competency refers to how good an athlete's technique and movement quality is. Now, this is going to be subjective to the coach's opinion, but specific things that you want to take into consideration about technique and movement are things like, are there any tendencies of breakdown with an athlete when they get fatigued through a set? Or do they break down in a way that is inconsistent? Like for example, one rep, they sway too much to the left and another rep, they sway too much to the right. Now this is endpoint variability. If they are someone who is like this, you may want to be a little bit more conservative with the RP prescription. The second factor that you want to take into consideration is training history. Now, any previous experience is going to be a useful indicator of knowing what may work and it's important to note that more recent training data is likely going to have more weight, pun not intended, with what may work now, as opposed to training that was done about five years ago. Now, the third factor is going to be athlete tendency with RPE accuracy. Now, knowing what good athletes are like to adhere to the prescribed RPE and knowing whether they have a tendency to undershoot or overshoot is useful to know. Now, you may not necessarily deliberately under or over prescribe an RPE, but it may have an influence on whether you may implement other strategies like load caps or target load ranges. And next factor uh, you want to take into consideration is health conditions or injury status. Now, how healthy your body is will determine the risk of being exposed to higher RPEs, particularly if injury is exacerbated by the primary lifts. Now, an injured athlete may mean it's worth lowering the RPE a little bit more and potentially spreading the volume over more sets. Now, the next factor is going to be your competitive calendar. Now, when your next meet is it will influence what you allow yourself or the athlete to be exposed to. Now, if you are further away from competition, you may have a bit more room to be a bit more experimental with RPE exposures to see how the athletes respond to them, particularly if they are high RPEs for example, above RPE8. Now, knowing how athletes respond to being exposed to certain RPEs may help you be a bit more careful and selective with RPEs during specific weeks in a competition prep cycle. For example, if you or the lifter needs that exposure to high RPEs for a sufficient stimulus, or if you find that you or the lifter gets completely wrecked from high RPEs, you'll know how to determine peak RP exposure in the peak and taper. Now, the next one is going to be fatigability of certain RPEs. Now, knowing the fatigability of certain sets at certain RPEs is useful, and this may vary from athlete to athlete and from rep range to rep range. Now, if you prescribe straight sets at an initial RPE, the equivalent dose of the set remains the same if the last set RPE remains the same as well. But if the RPE climbs through the sets, the equivalent percentage of a one rep max you will end up working at will climb also. The next factor is going to be training availability. So training availability refers to the practical side of training. Not everyone has the capacity to give up six days a week with three hour sessions. Now, if you or the athlete has lower training capacity, then the chances are that you may want to squash more volume over less sets and train at a high RPE as a consequence and vice versa as well. So let's get started with a process leading up to working out your RPEs. First, let's go through choosing your RPE for a top set. Now, 
Choosing your RPs for the top set is going to be somewhat easier to figure out because you're only dictating the stimulus for one set, but it does have consequences for subsequent sets and sessions to an extent. As a proportion of your weekly stressor, it's a relatively small portion. You will need to first consider the meso cycle objectives. This is basically setting the context and the scene that will guide you to what the athlete may need in terms of the training exposure. In simple terms, you may want to consider whether the meso cycle or training block is a competition prep or an off-season block. By off-season, I basically mean a training block that isn't a competition peak and taper. Some people call it strength blocks, other people may call it developmental cycles. So you also want to take into context of the session relative to that week as well, i.e. is this a top set on a primary day, secondary day, or so on and so forth. As your top set is most likely going to be your peak intensity, if it is also the top set for your primary day, it's likely going to be the peak intensity, not just for that session, but for that week too. Now, if a session within a peak and taper or competition prep, you may want to consider when you want that peak intensity as well and what that peak intensity is. For example, you may decide that the peak intensity that you want to be exposed to is around, let's say, 93%, which for most people, that may equate to about a heavy single at RP8, give or take. And that may be one to two weeks out from that competition. To consider the peak intensity you want to be at for competition prep, you may also consider having a top set from the equivalent to 85% to about 95% of your one max. For an off-season training block, you may want to consider setting your top set to an equivalent of 80 to about 93% of your one rep max. It's worth remembering that the higher the percentage you want to be exposed to, the lower the reps that you can or should be prescribing. To clarify, it's the hypothetical of a one rep max of that training day. One really useful tool that you may want to check out is an RP percentage chart. Now, this will give you a rough idea of what options you have as a top set prescription. Next, you want to consider the rep range for that top set. The higher rep range you want to use for that one top set, the higher the RP is going to be after you've decided what that intensity is. For example, let's say you want someone to work at around 89 to 90%. Depending on the athlete, this could look like a single RP7, or if you want a slightly more potent top set, you may choose to do two reps, and that would equate to about RP8. Ultimately, the latter will, will be more stressful or stimulating for that lifter, and if high enough, could be fatiguing for your back offsets. On top of this, you then want to consider how many reps you want to attribute to this top set rather than the back offsets, especially if you have data on previous training that leads to good progress and you know the total reps and average intensity that the athlete works well with. As much as top sets can be somewhat potentiating for subsequent back offsets, you do want to consider the athlete's fatigability for that given RPE. For example, I personally find some lifters find that RPEs higher than RP8 to be fatiguing immediately for the back offsets, which isn't great because consequently what happens is, is that the top set will end up nerfing the volume work and the weight that they can do for the volume work may be suppressed. Or if it is a fixed load, then the RP of their working sets will be a lot higher. You also want to consider how much you want to be able to monitor the top set performance. This may be more relevant leading up to the end of a block or leading up to a competition. In this scenario, you may want to consider working at a higher percentage and or higher RPE. Lastly, you also want to consider the risk and reward for prescribing a certain RPE. Remember that the top set is not going to be the be all and end all of the training stimulus for that session, depending on how much volume there is in the back of sets. So you want to consider the risk and reward for choosing higher RPE such as 8.59 or above. So you ultimately want to consider the risk of overshooting and the likely impact for performance short term. Now, this may not be a big deal in the off season, but in the competition prep, this may matter more. It's also worth noting that the higher RP that you work at, the more exponentially fatiguing those sets can be. And if you want to find out more information, check out this video here about how hard powerlifters should be working at. Now back to topic. Now, moving on to determining the RPE of your back off sets, this is going to be more influential of the whole training session and subsequently the training week as well. And the reason why that is, is because back offsets generally carry more impact on adaptations through much higher levels of volume. However, this may not necessarily always be the case if there aren't that many back offsets done after the top set. So it's going to vary from person to person. Now, just like figuring out the top sets, you want to figure out 
the extent of the back of sets that you are programming. So where the session is within a micro cycle or training week, i.e. whether it's a primary day or otherwise, and also training frequency as well, where the micro cycle is within the meso cycle, i.e. whether it's near the start, the middle or the end of a block, and what the aim of the meso cycle is, whether it's an off season training block or peaking block. Assuming you know what the average intensity is, that your program needs to be around roughly. If you don't know what this is, you can analyze previous training that have been effective to determine what the average intensity needs to be around. If you want a really useful tool, check out my program analyzer tool in the description box below. You then want to consider roughly how much volume, total reps, total hard sets that you want to attribute to each training session. This will obviously determine how big of a stimulus each session is going to be. Assuming that you have an idea of what level of volume works best for this lifter from looking at previous training data, what you can then do is estimate roughly what percentage of one max this lifter should do and subsequently be working at for each given session. Through analyzing the average intensity, you can then tweak the training variables to get you to start the whole week at the right region of average intensity. Again, use the program analyzer if you need to. Now, if it is an introduction week, you may want to start the RPs a little bit lower to create a bit more space to make progress in subsequent weeks. This will help you ensure against overtraining initially at the start of the week, just in case your level of readiness at the start isn't quite there. Now, this will obviously bring down the average intensity of the training week initially, but when you take the rest of the block into consideration, it may average out to the ideal range or percentage that you want to be at. The other thing that you want to take into consideration and this is particularly more important, is how much of the first set RP will influence the RP of the subsequent sets. If you find yourself in a situation where in order to hit the average intensity for that day, the RP ends up being high, you may want to consider spreading the reps out over more sets. For example, instead of three by five at RP eight, you may want to choose five by three at RP six. The problem with having a high RP for a first back off set is not necessarily because it's high, but more so what fatigue will do to the performed RP in the later sets, which can increase the equivalent percentage of a one at max that you are going to be working at. This may or may not necessarily be a bad thing, but you may not necessarily want it to change too much. And importantly, it's also worth taking into consideration of the athlete opinion and perception of the prescribed program too, as sometimes they may have insight that you do not have. So I hope this helps expand your processes in determining the RPs of your top sets and back sets. If you like this video and genuinely found some usefulness from this video, please subscribe to the channel as it helps the channel grow a lot. And as always, I will see you guys on the next one.